This Family Life News Podcast is made possible by the support of listeners like you. It's the Noon Report from Family Life, bringing a Christian worldview to what's happening in New York, Pennsylvania, across the country, and around the world. Weather with Kevin Williams, plus special features and reports with the Family Life News team. Now, here's what's happening. Face to face. Good afternoon. Welcome to the broadcast. Donald Trump met today at the White House with the man who replaced him and whom he'll replace come January 20th. President Biden and President-elect Trump talking transition of power and presidential priorities as Team Trump continues to take shape. Former White House advisor Karl Rove on the breakneck speed at which Trump is moving. He realizes he's got a limited window. He knows he's got big issues. So he's moved rather rapidly. Bang, 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 get it going. He realizes from having been there how precious time is. Trump last night picked a TV host and former military man to be his defense secretary and a pair of billionaires to root out government waste. Your money is being wasted and the Department of Government Efficiency is going to fix that. Elon Musk, the world's richest man and former GOP presidential contender Vivek Ramaswamy will lead Doge, the Department of Government Efficiency. It is going to take a leader from the outside with fresh legs. And in a surprise pick that nobody saw coming, Trump chose Army vet and Fox News personality Pete Hegseth to serve as his defense secretary. The 44-year-old Hegseth promised to rid the Pentagon of all things DEI. If this thing goes helplessly woke, we're in serious trouble because our enemies are chomping at the bit. And he's on record opposed to women serving in combat. We should not have women in combat roles. It uh, hasn't made us more effective, hasn't made us more lethal, has made fighting more complicated. Trump's also tapped former National Intelligence Director John Ratcliffe to lead the CIA and selected former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee to be our next ambassador to Israel. In the U.S. Senate today, Republicans are picking a new majority leader. They haven't done that in about two decades. There are three contenders, John Cornyn, John Thune, and Rick Scott of Florida. It's a decision that will have a major impact on the final four years of the Trump presidency. Republican senators will vote in private. Florida Senator Rick Scott has led a public campaign for the position, and many in the president-elect's inner circle support him. Senators John Thune and John Cornyn have been pitching fellow Republicans in private. Trump has endorsed no candidate. Reporter Rich Edson on Capitol Hill. Inflation by the numbers. The Consumer Price Index went public today, and it shows inflation is still stubbornly high. Business analyst Christine Roman. The last few years, eggs and gas and groceries, these are the prices that really I think people took to the ballot box with them. The CPI rose by more than 2.5% last month. Reporter Tally O'Grady. It's not what the Federal Reserve or investors want to see in the fight against inflation, but I want to emphasize size. This last mile tends to be a little bit bumpy in the fight against inflation. So one month is not so much cause for panic. Higher rent, electricity costs, used car prices, and airfare helped fan the flames of this latest inflation report. The government would like that CPI to be closer to 2%, which is a sign that inflation may be back to pre-pandemic levels. Two people killed overnight when a factory exploded in Louisville, Kentucky, that plant makes the ingredients used in soft drinks. The cause of the blast is still under review. Wild fires are typically something we see out west, but there's a big one brewing on the east coast where New York meets New Jersey. Chris Franek with the New Jersey Fire Service. We're in very steep, rugged train. Fire crews are pretty much they're hiking their way in. There's really no easy access. The wildfires already consumed more than 5,000 acres and killed an 18-year-old volunteer fire ranger. American Airlines says one of its planes was also hit by gunfire in Haiti. Spirit and JetBlue flights came under attack earlier this week in the war-torn country. The FBI is now participating in this investigation, and the FAA has issued an order to U.S. airlines to avoid Haiti 
for the next 30 days. Aviation expert Chris Van Cleve. Still to come on the Noon Report, a midweek edition. Burn ban, wanted posters, and peanut the squirrel. Back in the news. Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Williams looking at a sunny, crisp afternoon. We'll have forecast details straight ahead. We'll see you in 10 minutes. All right, looking pretty good out there. Thank you very much, Kevin. Let's check some of the stories that are making news where you live. All across New York and Pennsylvania, a statewide outdoor burn ban is now in effect in New York. This as dangerous wildfires continue to burn out of control in the lower Hudson Valley. New York Governor Kathy Hoko. Right now we have 15 wildfires, uh, varying degrees of size and and dangerousness, but particularly here in Orange and Ulster counties, I'd like to give an update. Right now, New York State is facing the largest wildfire since 2008. That burn ban will remain in effect all across New York until at least the end of November. The Pennsylvania U.S. Senate race between Bob Casey and Dave McCormick is still in limbo. Casey's refusing to concede, and the razor-close contest may be headed for a recount. Across our Commonwealth, close to 7 million people cast their votes in a free and fair election. Our county election officials will finish counting those votes just like they do in every election. The American democratic process was born in Pennsylvania, and that process will play out. McCormick's already declared victory in this race if the final margin of victory winds up being less than one half of one percent, an automatic recount would be triggered. New York Congressman Mark Molinaro has conceded in the battle for the state's 19th congressional district. He lost to Democrat Josh Riley by less than 10,000 votes. Votes. That district covers the southern tier, Hudson Valley, and parts of the Finger Lakes region. Nine-term Pennsylvania Congressman Glenn G.T. Thompson being considered as Agriculture Secretary in President-elect Trump's administration. The Republican representative already serves as Chairman of the House Agriculture Committee. Thompson's 15th congressional district spans all or some of 18 counties in Pennsylvania. It is a massive district. New York's 22nd District Congressman Brandon Williams, he might not be leaving Washington after all. The New York Post reports the defeated Republican is being considered for a cabinet post as well. The exact role remains a mystery. Williams was beaten by Democrat John Mannion in the race to represent that district. It covers Onondaga and Madison counties, as well as parts of Cortland, Oneida, and Cayuga counties. New York Governor Kathy Hochul letting low-income residents know that there's help available to help them afford heat this winter. And for lower-income New Yorkers, energy costs can range between 10 and 20 percent of their entire household income. Think about that. Right off the top. The Home Energy Assistance Program, or HEAP, provides up to $1,000 in energy assistance to qualifying families. Now, for a family of four with $76,000 in income, that's a significant benefit. Just even a year ago, it was only $70,000, so we're continuing to raise the income threshold from $70,000 to seventy-six and keep pushing it upward. The HEAP program helped one and a half million New Yorkers afford HEAT last winter. Pennsylvania Democrats will retain their one-seat majority in the State House as a result of the recently concluded elections. In the State Senate, Republicans ruled the roost again, and that means divided government once again in Harrisburg next year. Senate Majority Leader Joe Pittman. Divided government is not dysfunctional government. We will work to compromise where we can. There were some bipartisan successes this past session, says House Speaker Joanna McClinton, especially when it comes to public education. When those school tax bills go out next year, they will see a reduction because House Democrats and Senate Republicans sat down and did the people's work. While Democrats claim to a one-vote majority in the House, Republicans hold an eight-seat majority in the Pennsylvania Senate. Autopsy results are in on Peanut the Squirrel in Chemung County, New York. Turns out the social media star did not have rabies when it was euthanized in a controversial government raid last month. Andrew Whitman has our report. Peanut was seized October 30th after complaints that wildlife was being kept illegally at the Pine City home and animal sanctuary of owner Mark Longo. 
Longo insists he would have complied with laws governing when wild animals can be kept, but he says he needed more guidance from officials. Peanut bit a state worker as he was being seized, so the squirrel was euthanized and tested for rabies. Those tests came back negative. The state agency involved in the case is now reviewing policies and procedures and is investigating its response. This story's become a huge deal in the southern tier. Shimon County Executive Chris Moss weighing in on the squirrel controversy. He defends how his health department responded. The health department had nothing to do with the search, nothing to do with the search warrant. I realize people want to vet, but at the end of the day, I think you have to realize the seriousness of a human contracting rabies. This is protocol from the state down to the county. The county health department only did what, uh, you know, what the protocol is. Moss admits, however, with hindsight being 2020. One thing we will look at is the expeditious manner that these animals were euthanized and could we have waited another day or two to see exactly what's going on. But nobody was aware of the social media presence of either one of these animals and whether that would have played a role or not. Once the squirrel bit a human, um, it was probably only a matter of time before the testing needed to be conducted. Pina the squirrel and a raccoon named Fred were both both euthanized after being seized from a wildlife sanctuary in Pine City, New York. Anti-Semitic posters at the University of Rochester are raising some alarm bells today. The so-called wanted posters depicted faculty and staff who've publicly supported the state of Israel in its ongoing war against terrorism. These kinds of posters will only actually fuel the fire and cause more hatred and divisiveness in our community. That's Meredith Dragon with the Jewish Federation of Greater Rochester. The university has a lot of work to do with the Jewish community to ensure that people feel safe and secure on campus because right now they don't. It's not yet known who is responsible for these posters. They were discovered Sunday evening at the University of Rochester. The two-minute drill next in sports right here on The Family Life Noon Report. Good afternoon, I'm Randy Snavely. Bob Joel Embiid was finally back in the lineup for the Philadelphia 76ers, but his season debut didn't really help Philly. The Knicks took them down 111-99. OG and you know, led New York with 24 points, while Josh Hart had a triple-double. 14 points, 12 rebounds, and 10 assists. The Knicks did a really good job of spreading the scoring around. Anthony Towns had 21 points and 13 boards and Jalen Brunson chipped in with 18. Embiid scored 13 as Philadelphia fell to 2-8 and eight on the season. The Knicks are 5-5. Five and five. Atlanta, Detroit, Orlando, the Bucks, Suns, Warriors, and Blazers also won their games. On the ice, the Winnipeg Jets showed why they are the cream of the crop in the NHL. They moved a 15-1 on the season with a 6-3 win over the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. The Islanders fell in overtime to Edmonton 4-3. Also skating to wins, the Senators, Devils, Bruins, Canucks, and Kraken. In college basketball, number 18 Kentucky upset number 6 Duke 77-72. And Major League Baseball has handed out their Silver Slugger Awards. Yankee outfielders Aaron Judge and Juan Soto both won. And in the National League, Mets shortstop Francisco Lindor picked up the award, as did the Phillies' first baseman, Bryce Harper. To no one's surprise, the world champion Dodgers had three winners, outfielder Teoscar Hernandez, D.H. Shohei Otani, and utility player Mookie Betts. That is a look at sports. Thank you, Randy Man. Still to come on the Noon Report, a midweek edition, Team Trump taking shape. Trump's triumphant return to Washington and meet the TV personality. Tap to lead our military. Welcome to Breakpoint, a daily look at an ever-changing culture through the lens of unchanging truth. For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Wallace. In The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien writes of Gollum's relationship with the One Ring. Quote, he hated it and loved it. He could not get rid of it. He had no will left in the matter. Well, a new survey suggests that something similar has happened with Generation Z and another powerfully addictive object, the smartphone. 
especially when it functions as a portal to social media. Writing in the New York Times, psychologist and author Jonathan Haidt details a new Harris poll of over a thousand 18 to 27 year olds about their experience with and attitudes toward technology. The most shocking finding was that around half of Generation Z wishes social media platforms like TikTok and X didn't exist. Considering 60% of Gen Z adults spend at least four hours a day on social media and a further 23% spend seven or more hours daily, that's remarkable. But it makes perfect sense when you realize that people can dislike something and still be addicted to it. As Haidt wrote, quote, Feelings of regret or resentment are common with addictive products, cigarettes, for example, and addictive activities like gambling, even if most users say they enjoy them. Though the members of Gen Z in this survey were all adults, their insights are still valuable. Recall that they are the first generation of digital natives, those who never knew a world before smartphones or other internet-capable mobile devices. Perhaps that explains why 8 in 10 associate social media with the word addicting, and a third said they use it out of force of habit. Considering how early many of these kids were handed a screen, they never stood a chance. In his book, The Anxious Generation, Haidt recalls the gut punch moment when his young daughter approached him and said, Daddy, can you take the iPad away from me? I'm trying to take my eyes off it, but I can't. He goes on to show that the addictive power of smartphones and social media is a feature, not a bug. They were designed to do this. But it's not just the addictive quality of sites like X and TikTok that leave young people wishing they could quit. There's also something innately unhealthy about these platforms, especially for the young. 37% of respondents to this survey said that social media had a negative impact on their emotional health. Women in particular, 44%, were likely to feel this way. And incredibly, 60% of respondents said that social media has had a negative impact on society. Nearly twice the number who said it has had a positive impact. A look at the two sites Gen Z hates the most suggests explanations. X, formerly Twitter, has long been known as the ultimate cancellation machine, a place where people's careers and reputations are often ruined by a foolish post and where one-liners and mobs trump rational discussion. Gen Z souring on social media is good news. It coincides with other hopeful signs of a backlash against addictive tech. But at the rate this stuff advances, time is crucial. If kids who haven't yet gotten hooked are going to stand a chance, we need a better vision of childhood, a clearer idea of where screens fit into it, and a cultural shift back toward embodied relationships. The fact that half of digital natives wish the biggest social media sites didn't exist is the clearest cry for help I can imagine. Like a certain ring, this stuff has a mind of its own. Let's not let it steal another generation's ability to look away. For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris. Shane, thank you very much. Let's head outside next. Weatherman Kevin Williams. Here is your family life weather forecast for this afternoon. Sunny, the high temperatures, 40s and low 50s. Increasing clouds tonight, not as cold as it was last night. Low temps, upper 20s and mid 30s. Tomorrow, a fair amount of cloudiness. It could be a little rain moving into western Pennsylvania and far southwest New York. As the day wears on, a few wet flakes as well. High temps, 40s and low 50s. And clouds give way to sunshine Friday with high temperatures, mid-40s to the mid-50s. All right, thank you, Kevin. This is the Noon Report on Family Life. I'm your host, Bob Price. Great to have you with us today. Lots going on Wednesday, the 13th of November. After a bruising election, President Biden and President-elect Trump met face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball, at the White House today. They talked transition of power and presidential priorities. Earlier, Trump met with congressional Republicans on Capitol Hill. I just want to thank everybody. You've been incredible. We worked with a lot of you to get you in, and you helped me too. The 45th president officially becomes the 47th on January 20th. Trump's already working hard at stocking his cabinet. In a surprise move, he's tapped Fox News personality Pete Hegseth to serve as defense secretary. The 44-year-old Princeton grad is a decorated army vet who served in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Correspondent Aisha Haas 
Ghazni. He is touting Pete Hegseth's commitment to the military forces. He says of Hegseth, nobody fights harder for the troops, and Pete will be a courageous and patriotic champion of our peace through strength policy. Trump's also selected former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee to be his ambassador to Israel. Reporter Weijia Zhang. It is a critical role as Trump tries to fulfill a promise of ending the war in Gaza. And as the cabinet filling continues, reporter Major Garrett says, take note of those named two posts that do not need Senate confirmation. Keep your eye on czars. Tom Holman is exactly what I mean. He is going to have more influence over border security and deportation policy than the Homeland Security Secretary ever will. Also named to Team Trump is former National Intelligence Director John Ratcliffe. He's been tapped to lead the CIA. Trump clamored for cutting government waste while on the campaign trail, and now he's turning that rhetoric into action. We're going to get the government off your back and out of your pocketbook. The president-elect tasked that man, Elon Musk, the world's richest man, and Vivek Ramaswamy, a former GOP rival with leading Doge, the Department of Government Efficiency. Elon thinks he can cut the costs of our government by $2 trillion. Ramaswamy campaigned on eliminating federal agencies like the FBI and Department of Education. It's unclear how much power Doge will have. Reporter Brooke Singman continues our coverage. Trump says the goal of that department is to cut excess regulations, cut wasteful spending, and restructure federal agencies. Now, Musk says all actions of the department will be posted online for maximum transparency. Anytime the public thinks they are cutting something important or not cutting something wasteful, just let them know. And Ramaswamy says, quote, Americans voted for drastic government reform and they deserve to be part of fixing it. That's Brooke Singman on Doge, the newly created Department of Government Efficiency. For the first time in nearly two decades, Senate Republicans are selecting a new leader. Senator John Thune of South Dakota, Senator John Cornyn of Texas, and Senator Rick Scott of Florida in the race to replace longtime leader Mitch McConnell. Here's reporter Ryan Noble. The new Senate majority will play a major role in fulfilling Trump's campaign promises. From tax cuts to immigration reform to judicial nominations, it must all come through the Senate. Meantime, the race for control of the House still not settled. Republicans need to just win two of the 12 races remaining to maintain their majority status. The House Oversight Committee is hearing now Next week, from the head of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. This after it was discovered that dozens of hurricane-wrecked homes in Florida were passed over for assistance because they had Trump signs. Florida Attorney General Ashley Moody. With regards to FEMA, they are being now presented with evidence that they were treating people differently based on their partisan views. That is an incredible discovery in the United States of America. Homes with Trump signs were skipped in the town of Lake Placid, Florida, after Hurricanes Helene and Milton. The head of FEMA has been called to explain this act of blatant discrimination before Congress next Tuesday. A judge in Louisiana has blocked a law requiring the Ten Commandments be on display in public schools. That law was set to kick in in January. A federal judge in Baton Rouge called it coercive and discriminatory. An appeal has been made to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, the most conservative appeals court in this country. A new survey shows a correlation between excessive media scrolling and poor mental health. The average American will spend six hours a day consuming some type of media online. Social media safety expert Dave Bass. The Surgeon General of the United States wants to put a warning label on social media. There is a lot of concern around how this is affecting our society. It is affecting depression, and it's not just with adults, it's with kids. Polls show two-thirds of Gen Zers admit they spend too much time scrolling. More than half say their mood is negatively affected by social media. That generation of Americans is on their phones on average, get this, 50 15 hours a day. You're tuned in to the Noon Report for Wednesday on Family Life. 
if you're expecting someone living with dementia at your holiday table this year, you may be wondering if some things should change so that everyone feels included. Welcome to Family Life's Inside Out, where we're going to be talking about just that. I'm Martha Manikas Foster. My guest today is Phil Shippers. He's with the Alzheimer's Association. He's the program director for Rochester, New York and the Finger Lakes region. Phil, I'd love it if you'd start us out by by describing how a person with dementia might react to holiday gatherings. And are there parts of the celebrations we should adapt or just do away with if we want to make our times together more pleasant for everyone? Everyone, you know, acts a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. But in general, as the disease progresses, people become more withdrawn. Realize that people living with dementia are changing, even if they seem to be themselves. Uh They may be feeling anxious. So don't put them on the spot. Absolutely. So we want to avoid situations that could be embarrassing to the person living with dementia. We always want to preserve dignity. We have to realize that, you know, due to the changes in the brain, the person is trying to interpret their environment. So being part of a social event may be upsetting or confusing or stressful. Mm -hmm. So they feel bad about it because there's an expectation that they should know what's going on? Absolutely. Yeah. And there are things that we can do about that. Okay, please. Yes. One of the suggestions that we make is that when people approach the person living with Alzheimer's or dementia, that they introduce themselves. And it doesn't have to be formal or stuffy. You can just make light of it saying, oh, this is your favorite grandson, mm-hmm. Patrick, or I'm your long lost daughter from Tennessee. You mm-hmm. know, you can you can kind of put things in context by how you phrase your greeting. Mm-hmm. Now, if people with dementia feel overwhelmed by part of the holiday celebrations, what can we do instead to to mark the important days but not do the part that might make it confusing or embarrassing? I think the biggest thing is to be flexible and perhaps to change our expectations, maybe try new things. And we want to do this to reduce commotion, to reduce noise and activity, to make the person living with dementia feel more comfortable. We may want to look at things that might be taxing to the individual. So maybe instead of going to church, you know, maybe you attend church virtually, Uh or maybe you have a holiday brunch instead of a dinner late in the evening. It's best to keep the person living with dementia on their own schedule. Mm -hmm. So we want to make it easy for them to, to take a break, We want to consider having smaller gatherings. You know, families can get boisterous, you know. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Especially mine. So (laughs) instead of having one big party, maybe you want to have, you know, a few smaller gatherings. Yeah. We also want to consider assigning a companion, perhaps, to the person living with Alzheimer's and dementia. That person might be able to provide some cues to the person living with dementia about, you know, who people are or what's happening. You know, maybe there's a game or an activity going on that might need some explaining. It's also an opportunity to really keep track of how the person might be feeling. What, What great ideas. The important thing is that the person is involved. You know, our enjoyment of the holiday doesn't go away. You know, we just have to experience it in different ways. If we're simply fellow guests and we want to be the best fellow guests or or grandchildren or sibling to someone who is in cognitive decline, are there things that we should keep in mind as fellow guests when we're at a festivity that includes someone with Alzheimer's? You know, we have to remember that changes are happening in the person's brain and they are beyond the person's control. So it's best that we not quiz them. Remember who I am, mm-hmm. you know, or do you remember that time? You know, so it's it's really best just to avoid those types of situations. What we can do instead is share a memory. Oh, Grandma, I remember, you know, coming to your house in the summers and, and really enjoying myself. And I, I used to love swimming in the lake, mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. Share happy, positive memories with the person. And you know what? It doesn't matter if they don't exactly remember, you know, which grandchild you are in in what order, but they know that you're dear to them. Mm -hmm. So don't be offended if the person isn't able to remember your name. That's okay. They still love you. They still want to be around you. In a sense, we have to get over our own potential hurt to remember that the best thing is that we're loving them and that they're feeling loved. 
Absolutely. And we're all humans. So we don't always say and do the right things. Mm -hmm. My own parents had Alzheimer's and I can't tell you the number of times I started a conversation with, have you seen so-and-so or do you remember? Mm -hmm. You know, that's just human nature. So give yourself some grace as well and just be as positive and really enjoy the moment as, as much as you can. Good stuff there from Phil Shippers with the Alzheimer's Association speaking to our own Martha Manikis Foster on this week's edition of Inside Out. Good afternoon. Here is your Family Life Regional Weather Forecast. A sprawling area of high pressure is set to produce a sunny, crisp afternoon. That high will push east and allow weak low pressure to pass to our south tomorrow and tomorrow night. That'll bring clouds to the entire area and a little spot of rain or a mixed precip for some, especially western Pennsylvania, later tomorrow and tomorrow evening. Then the sky's clear again for what looks like a dry, cool, seasonable weekend. For this afternoon, sunny. The high temperatures, 40s and low 50s. Increasing clouds tonight, not as cold as it was last night. Low temps, upper 20s and mid 30s. Tomorrow, a fair amount of cloudiness. It could be a little rain moving into western Pennsylvania and far southwest New York as the day wears on a few wet flakes as well. High temps, 40s and low 50s. And clouds give way to sunshine Friday with high temperatures mid 40s to the mid 50s. All right, thank you, Kevin. Finally at noon, it is cool to be kind. And today we celebrate that underappreciated attribute called kindness. Family Life's Brian Query. It was November 13th, 1998, the day of the formation of the World Kindness Movement and start of the annual celebration of World Kindness Day, when a group of nations pledged in a written declaration to join together to build a kinder and more compassionate world. Celebrated internationally, this holiday presents us with an opportunity to reflect upon one of the most important and unifying human principles, kindness. The World Kindness Movement is hoping to have the day recognized by the United Nations, highlighting good deeds in our communities, focusing on the positive power and common threads that bind us. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it's also Cardigan Day in honor of Mr. Rogers and the kindness he showed on his television program. In a time when being nice to each other sometimes seems to elude us, today we choose to focus on the positive positive potential of both large and small acts of kindness, a crucial quality that can truly bring people together. Brian Query, Family Life News. Hi, Brian. Thank you very much. And for the record, folks, there's not a kinder person on this planet that I can think of than Mr. Brian Query. And that's our world, the world we live in Wednesday, November 13th. I'm Bob Price, Family Life News. You've been listening to the Noon Report, heard weekdays on Family Life. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to this Family Life News Podcast. If you've been encouraged by what you've heard, please share it with others and click the subscribe button to automatically receive future episodes. Family Life is a listener-supported ministry. Podcasts like this are made possible by your financial partnership. Find out more at familylife.org.